So, good morning to all of you. Thank you very much for showing up on a Sunday morning. And we're delighted to welcome all guests, whether they are IMF staff, members of their family, because I know that the Family Association has, a, is, has convened some of its members and is finding this event interesting, and all our guests uh, on the occasion of these annual meetings. We have decided for the first time to do something slightly different with very high level participation on the other side of the table. But a bit unusual because it is not your normal double PhD, although not necessarily somebody who is writing massive books on macroeconomics with plenty of charts across the board and back and forth, but somebody who is taking a real interest in matters that are of interest to the IMF. Obviously, he needs very little introduction, but we're going to give Michael Lewis a huge big round of applause for accepting our invitation. Please join me in welcoming Thank him. You. And if it works, we might do it again another time. <laughs> so we have a challenge, Michael, here. Your books include I don't want to forget any of them, and I'm sure I'm, I am going to forget. Liar's Poker, everybody knows that one. Flash Boys, everybody knows that one too. Big Short, and I'm only naming the big ones that everybody has read. Many of you have also seen the films that have been made out of those books, and have found those stories, which are quite complicated as the way in which they eventually happened, clear, obvious. And that is one of the many talents that our guest has. So the game we're going to play is the following. I ask you questions, you ask me questions, and we both commit to answer honestly. Shall we? <laughs> can, we can we just do two <laughs> truths and a lie instead? <laughs> sure. Maybe we can save the lies for the last ones, OK? <laughs> can I start? You go first. Thank you. Absolutely. So, You've written extensively about the financial world. You yourself had a role in the financial sector, which is one of the reasons you took a particular interest in how good or bad it can be. It does produce devastating effects, particularly in 2008 and following, destroyed massive wealth. Do you think things have changed? Um, well, that's a big question. Obviously, some things have changed. Uh, let me back, can I back up just a little bit? Yes, please. So, so um, first, let us just acknowledge how improbable it is I'm sitting up here on this stage with you. Uh, that when I was, I was telling Christine backstage that, uh, that when I was coming out of the London School of Economics, I wandered into a, a job interview with the IMF, and there was a ruthless German there who took about 60 seconds to realize in the room? I had absolutely no business being there, and the next 30 minutes demonstrating that. And, and if you told that man, I wish I knew, I, w I hope he's here, that, <laughs> that, that I would be sitting on stage with her, or actually that she would be sitting on stage at that point would be the idea of a woman running the IMF, right? So, is it, so things have changed. Um, I was, so, so what, but, but so, you're not so looking you for a me, job eventually? Well, you know, you never know, but uh, I, 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 you know, I'd like to think that instead of a job, if you're looking to compensate me, just a little more material would be good. <laughs> but the, but the um, so when you ask me, have, have things changed? Yeah. I was aware when I was writing Liar's Poker that I was writing about a financial culture that was in transformation. And it was very clear then that the, there were some big thi things at, at work that were potentially corrosive. They were the decline of the partnership structure at the center of American finance, so transformation from partnerships to corporations, the rising complexity of financial instruments, which quickly came to function as a form of opacity, that all the dark wood panel came down, all the glass went up, it all seemed more transparent, but as it got more complicated, it didn't matter, you know, it might as well have been dark wood panel. Um, and the rise of the idea that of these banks were essentially not service 
enterprises, but trading enterprises. To the point where, you know, the one I work for, mm -hmm. Solomon Brothers, in 1990 and 91, the proprietary trading desk, which was just a dozen people, and a firm of 8,000 people generated more than 100% of the firm's profits. Oof. So the rest of the firm is unprofitable. Everything is aimed at these trading books. Flash forward to the financial crisis. It's very clear that all three of these changes play a very big role going into 2008. I mean, the question that brings me back to the story, I didn't think I was ever going to write about Wall Street again, but I couldn't believe that I, that it wasn't that the, it wasn't that I couldn't believe that the big Wall Street banks would do bad things to the rest of the world. That didn't surprise me. What surprised me is that they would commit suicide, and that, that there are attempts suicide. That you, if you look at back away from our financial system, for 30 years plus, it's had call on the best and the brightest across the Western world, and and the people it's attracting are not unself-interested people. And, they, and yet, somehow, when they came together in these, uh, these organizations, they, did com they tried to commit suicide. It was, it was a, a disaster. How, how those banks became the dumb money was what interested, got me back in. And it was very clear that there were lots of bad incentives at the heart of the thing that caused individuals in the banks to do things that were good for themselves but bad for the institution. Right. Um, it, and th th so when you ask, has it changed, I think, has, have the forces that led to the crisis been in any way um, offset by regulation? Have, has, has the financial sector been kicked on some different course? And I think, well, there have been some changes in compensation to try to make the relationship between the Wall Street employee and, and uh, the employer look more like the relationships in the old partnership system. Mm -hmm. the, the, mm. but, it, but it's not nearly enough. Um, there's certainly not been a decline in the complexity of the instruments. I mean, the complexity of the instruments has played a very big role. The, the, it's, so that hasn't changed at all. And there has been some effort to, to reduce the, uh, the importance of proprietary trading right. in, in the big institutions. But there's this whole other question. I, I hate to go on for too long. But no, 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 come on. So there, it's a two-part question because one is, have things changed in such a way that will reduce the likelihood that these banks will commit, the, the, these giant financial institutions will commit suicide and bring us all down with them. Well, yes, there's been some change there. Uh, has it changed in such a way that they will, are less likely to do bad things to the rest of us? Le much less so. And, but more importantly, in a weird way, more importantly, has, has, the, has the wider public been persuaded that the change has happened, and not at all. I mean, you, I mean, this, so that, that what regulation has been implemented is so complicated, uh, and and uh, poorly described mm. to the public that if you if you wander the streets and ask people what happened, what did they do to, about about Wall Street, people would say basically nothing. The nothing. banks seem to yeah. be bigger. They're still doing poisonous things like the, this Wells Fargo scandal. I mean, there's not the the. The toxic relationship between the financial sector and the rest of the society has not been addressed. Not been cured. Not been cured. And, and you see the political consequences. Uh, so I think it's still a big problem. But that's just me. And, uh, and it's just Wall Street, isn't it? Because if we look at the city, and I just want to recognize somebody who's sitting there, Minou Shafiq, who's been a member of the IMF and who's been instrumental in working on the regulations that apply in the UK. You, you know Minou as well. The bank, the bank of England has made a much greater attempt to attack the culture of finance. Right. And that, and that has to happen, I think. Uh, and it, it's, so it, it may be, I don't, and I don't know enough about what's actually happened in every other country. Right. The, the truth is, let us just accept the truth that I'm a bit of a fraud here. I mean, I write stories, I write books, and I, and I move in for a story and then I move out yeah. and, and I don't pay much attention afterwards. So, uh, so it's, it, yeah. I, but I have been, I have paid attention to Wall Street. What but, do you think? Do you think, does anything I just say strike you as completely idiotic? No. All right. That's good. No, I don't. First of all, I don't want to offend you right now because I don't <laughs> want you to leave that uh, podium for the moment. But uh, I think a lot of what you said is right. There have been lots of other things that have taken place, which hopefully makes those system more suicide resistant yep. and uh, taxpayers less accountable for the mess that is yes. eventually being created. Yep. So I think that that's a plus. But they would themselves. 
the regulators and the supervisors would themselves admit that there is still work to be done. On the complexity of instruments, absolutely. And we're not there yet, not, a, not at all. So one of the things I remember thinking as I was working on both the big short and what became Boomerang, the series I wrote about the European crisis, yeah. especially in Iceland, was how much better off we probably all would have been if men had been removed from the top of every large financial institution <laughs> and women had put in, been put in their place. And there's actually, there's, some, there's wonderful research that's been done about male overconfidence and its, effect, its financial effects. There's an economist named Terry O'Dean, who if you, yes. boys will be boys. Um, and uh, it, it, when, you went into, when I went into Iceland, that was, and I went to, kind of when it was fresh, it, it, there was a real sense, I mean, you had this nation, this so-called nation of 300,000 people. Um, and banks. And they all knew, and these three giant banks, and they all, they, everybody, every Icelander knew this, that the men had, had screwed up the country. That the men, and do you remember who fixed it? A, a woman. Yeah. Not, not, just, not just a woman, a, 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 a woman who was gay, a woman who would not even sleep with a man. Uh, uh, <laughs> And, and, uh, and so, so the, the um, but I, when I went in there, it was, it was, the men were so chastened. You could tell, it was a moment, at any, you, every married man knows this moment where he has told his wife, yeah, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. Don't, don't, we're not going to stop for directions. Don't look at the map. And then all of a sudden, you, uh, you're lost. You're, you're, you're dead. And, uh. <laughs> And, and it was because these men who'd been fishermen and who'd always known what they were doing got into this new thing called finance. And the, their, their, basically their wives thought, well, they knew what they were doing when they were fishing. They, maybe they know what they're doing now. And the moment I walk in, the only viable, the only viable financial advisory firm in Iceland was run by, it was a new one, run by a woman. And its business uh, pitch was, if you let me advi advise you in your financial affairs, I promise no man will participate, that it will be just females giving advice. And people were banging down their doors to, to get in. There was this, it was, so you could see in microcosm what I think happened more generally. And what I, I so here's, I'm groping towards a question for you. And the question is this, I was struck on the, as the financial crisis unspooled, how, how quickly and ruthlessly uh, the system uh, treated women who were near power. It was incredible how much blame landed on female desks when there were so few females in high positions. So Erin Callan and Sally Krawcheck and Zoe Cruz and the woman who was with the London Whale and JP Morgan. It was just, there was always a woman to blame. Yeah. So my question for you is, are you nervous? <laughs> Because whenever I see a woman put in a position of prominence in finance, I think she's there for one reason, to take the fall if things go wrong. So do you- I'll tell you, you something, Michael. If I take the blame for anything for which I'm not responsible, I'll call on you to yeah. help me. <laughs> I will. So you, this, but you know, not, you know this who... thought has not crossed your mind. <laughs> there we go. I think we've had a frank moment here. <laughs> Do you remember how many were whistleblowers as well? Most women, sorry, most whistleblowers in the pre-financial crisis, you know, the, uh, the, the, big, uh, the big Aaron and, uh, was it Aaron? Aeon. Yeah. Arthur Anderson, I mean, all Enron. The, yeah, Enron, yeah. thank you. The whistleblowers were all women. Yeah. Interesting, yeah? It is interesting. So what I can tell you though, is that things have not materially changed. In other words, when it's really messy, the women come in. They restore the situation to a place where it becomes a bit stable, a bit better, and then somehow the men come back. <laughs> yeah. We need to go to Iceland together. Yeah, we see do what need it's to go like. to Iceland together. It's, it's pretty great. Uh, well, so um, anyway, I would love to know from you, because it, I'd love for you to explain to me why in 2016 there still are so few women in positions of great authority in the financial sector. What's the, co what's the cause of that? First of all, there, there are a few more. You know, the Fed now has, has a, a woman leading it. Um, 
again well, cause for concern. That, well, yeah. she receives a lot more criticism, in my view, uh, than many of her predecessors in many ways, right. given the great job that she's doing. Right. Uh, Jeanette, that's for you. Um, but it, it, it's, it's true. When I look around the, uh, the G20 room, finance ministers, uh, very few women. Uh, when I look around uh, our IMFC, which is the group of, of uh, finance ministers and governors of central banks, very few women as well. And uh, I, I, I really think that we all have to collectively, men and women, push in the direction that you have indicated that women can, can actually bring a lot of value that is needed in the financial sector. It's okay if the trading is not as frequent and as, 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 uh, as you know, rapid as the boys would like to have it. Right. Because if it brings a bit of stability and a bit of, uh, of security to people at large and to that particular sector which is vital and yet uh, not exactly as it should be, it would be better, but it's, it's, it's not happening at the pace where it should. I agree. I agree. I once... Uh, 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 but maybe you can help, because I, you, know, you, you, uh, you are an incredible, an incredible communicator. Uh, people who don't understand financial markets, people who don't get why the, uh, the financial crisis started, people who don't understand what actually subprime means, you explained it all easily. For, 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 the, for, for, the, for the novice, for the layman, for the laywoman. Why can't you explain that women are better with a book, with a film, with something that really is just obvious? It's funny you should ask that because, um, so uh, it did, it is, it's striking to me that there's been this hole in the market for these stories set in the financial sector. Yeah. Uh, and the hole in the market exists because things aren't being explained clearly to ordinary people. Um, when I set out to write, I try, my, my ambition is always that my mother will want to read what I write and will understand yeah. it. Yeah. And when you're faced with trying to explain to my mother a collateralized debt obligation, it, the, the task is daunting. Now, the funny thing about this ambition is I don't think my mother even reads my books, but I like to think that one day <laughs> she might. Uh, but I have, a, there's, there's, there are... Um, I bet you she would read it if you wrote the one that I'm yes. suggesting. Yes, well, so the story, so the story it's, it, I have, an, um, my unslaked ambition in, uh, is to create a television drama. And the first television drama idea I had, and it's still kicking around, and I'm about to go try to push it again, was about three women who start a hedge fund. And the whole, the premise of the hedge fund is exploiting the idiocy of men. And, uh, and so that's all they're doing is they're finding the mistakes that men make mm. and they're profiting from that. And that would enable me to get at the problem. Getting that on the air is hard. I thought I, would, I got close once and I'm about to go try again. So there are, way, there are ways to, to and the, the power of, you know, even though what I do is probably slightly not respectable in the minds of the people who are in this room, and that I am crafting narratives out of pretty technical stuff, and simplifying in places, and you know, I, I have a feeling that half the room, if they would, would say, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he, he did an okay job of explaining the collateralized debt obligation, but he missed this over here. I'm, I'm sure that I'm not, because I'm not, I am not a finance specialist. I happen to have worked on Wall Street for a few years and, and understood that if you, that, that there are a lot of questions that always need to be asked. That the, you have to get underneath the jargon. Yeah. Um, and when you get underneath the jargon, the things, the stuff ceases to be all that complicated. Um, but uh, it, it, it is amazing the power of the narrative to, turn, to, to, to affect the way people think about all of this. So do you think we should apply those principles to us? Because we have stories to tell and we have recommendations to make and we have policies advised, but sometimes the message doesn't come across very well, and sometimes public opinions don't see that, number one, we've changed, number two, we might be advising for the better rather than for the worse. You know, it's funny, this. It's, um, it, uh, this is probably true of, of every arena of ambition, uh, that uh, it develops a language of its own, and 
if you're in the arena and you try to speak in some other language, you're discredited. That if you don't use the jargon true. you've handed. Very true. Uh, so I have a privileged position because I'm not in the arena. I, I, I come in as an interloper and I can, I can speak uh, about this, it, it, these things in looser terms. But if you tried to do it, they'd say you were an idiot. She doesn't know what she's talking about. I think it happened about. to me several times, yes. including in this institution. Yes, I'm sure that, so. Um, At the beginning. So <laughs> if, you try, if you try to communicate with people who know nothing whatsoever about finance in a way they will understand, it would cost you with the people who you have to deal with every day. Whereas, I don't have that, you know, what you should do, instead of trying to be more like me in the way you communicate with others, you should just create more of me. You should have, you should let people in who can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so building tr kind of trust with storytellers is a very good idea. And there are plenty of storytellers. I mean, you know, why isn't, uh, why aren't there great, there are some, but why, podcasts, uh, you know, coming out of the IMF, done by people who don't work for the IMF, or um, why isn't there a great Wall Street TV show? Uh, th th there is a, there's a, there is a, this, this market inefficiency and I, that I've made a career out of, right? I, I made a living out of selling millions of books to people who want to read about this sector um, uh, because nobody else is, nobody else is addressing them in a, in a way that they are engaged by. Um, so there are plenty of people who could do the job. They just need to be kind of invited to do the job, I think. I, got, I, I was an exception because I happened to work in the place for a little while, so I had, a, I had a pass, I had a way in. But if you're, I don't know, Ira Glass at This American Life, or Malcolm Gladwell, or one of these, I mean, these people out there who can do one, who are wonderful storytellers, um, if they were admitted into this realm, they'd work magic with public understanding. Uh, so that's what I, if I were in your shoes, that's what I would do. I'd start calling up people who I recognize as gifted storytellers and say, this may seem too complicated for you to understand, it's not. Mm. Come, come move in for six months and just see what, how it all works. So when we advocate uh, inclusive growth, when we push for trade, and recognize that trade has had huge benefits and some downside to it. And already I'm in the jargon, because downside, what does it mean to people? Right. Right? right. I know, I know. I, I'm, I'm, I've been contaminated, big way. Well, but, uh, but it's just, you know, it's a shorthand. You're speaking to people in the room who know exactly what yeah, you mean. Yeah, that's right. So why, why? So do you think that you could make a story out of that? I'm not, tr I'm, I'm not suggesting to. You know, the stories that need to be told are the stories about inequality right now. That this is, there are, two, there are two kinds of stories that seem to me to be wet, rich uh, th themes that need to be addressed and addressed very creatively. One is the inequality, inequality in the world, and uh, two is trust um, and the lack of trust. I tried to do this with this book. I wrote Flash Boys. I mean, it, what happens? I, d I wrote a whole book and the whole th about the the rigging of the American uh, stock market. And I still, in the most extraordinary, the most extraordinary financial things have been done. But what interested me was, um, someone on Wall Street was trustworthy, and was going to insist on being trustworthy, and was going to insist on introducing trust as the as the the main subject, and the effect that had on the environment around him, which is incredible, because the the whole system depends on trust, um, and we've kind of forgotten that. Uh, but the, that and this idea of it, your idea of inclusive growth, I think if, if that you're, that's another way of saying how do you, how do, how do you address in, the inequality in the world and m make the problems it gives rise to real. Um, I don't, I, off the top of my head, do I have a way of, do I, do I have a way of addressing, addressing that? No. But We can sure, think about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Could be done. <laughs> Could be done. Okay, that's Could be reassuring done. for us. It's interesting to me that you feel, you obviously feel some frustration with your ability to communicate. Yeah. Wh why, where does that come from? Well, I'll tell you the, the frustration we have is we have been repeating some messages lately about growth, about in, in inclusiveness, about inequality. But I think that we could come across in a much uh, louder, more efficient way. And we always ask ourselves, do we have the traction Right. Because we deal with finance ministers, we deal with governors of central banks who themselves are 
uh, hostage to their own government first and public opinion and the next election. Right. So we are, you know, looking at who are the interlocutors, who will make the difference at the end of the, of the day, which is why I think we, we need to tell that story beyond them as well and outreach to public opinion and to explain you know, what, what the positive outcome, uh, what the benefits there could be in doing this, that or the other. Uh, when you... Without, you know, without losing sight that there are, you know, finance ministers, governors of central banks are our natural interlocutors and we work with them and they implement the policies and they design the new laws and all the rest of it. But I think that we have to go as well in order to help them do their job. We have to go beyond that. If you stand up and give a speech where you unload your heart on the world, when you say, this is, w this is where I see the problems in the world and this is this is why we aren't addressing them properly. Um, does it get, do you get that? I've read some of your speeches and there's, you've done some of this. Um, is, are you surprised by the response or disappointed by the response? Do you feel like you're not listened to uh, and that you need to find another way to communicate? Uh, or uh, do you feel like there's just natural constraint in the, in the job and there's only so much you can do? I think the loudspeaker is not big enough. You don't have a big enough megaphone. <laughs> that, that's there. No, I want to yeah. suggest that you continue to help us because I think you would be fantastic. As part of our series here, do you mind if I ask you three questions that I will ask everybody who attends this program? Sure. Okay. So I have to be guided sure, by might. the team here. <laughs> if you had the choice today of being professionally somebody completely different, who would you be? Um, Steph Curry. He's, a, he's the shooting guard for the Golden State Warriors. Uh, but other than, <laughs> I mean, that, that would be the first thing. Really? But less realistically? Yeah. Um, no, so uh, the, the, uh, I had, you know, you go back in your life and you think, what paths yeah. might have, I have gone? So I might have become an art historian if there was a big market for art historians. That would have been the first thing that happened. Um, when that didn't happen, if I had absolutely no literary ability, I would be a financier. I would still be on Wall Street. Really? They were throwing huge sums of money at me. The people I told at Solomon Brothers that I was leaving to become a writer, they weren't worried I was going to write about whatever I was going to write about them. They were worried about my sanity. They th you, you're walking out of basically a, a life of being a rich person to do that. Uh, so, but I probably would have despaired at my ability to do anything productive. And I, I've never, I've never, so I've, never been, really I've never been, I've never been useful. And if you're not useful and you don't know very much, the only place you can really get rich is Wall Street. And so that's, that, it's almost, that's almost <laughs> certainly what I would have ended up doing. Uh, and I just stayed there and felt guilty about it probably. So God knows where that would have led. Well, I'm so glad you went. So that's so that those are the only two real, the realistic paths. Uh, and thank God that I've been able to do something other than that. Okay, if you had a magic stick, who would you like most to meet, whom you haven't met? Who I like most to meet than I, who I haven't met. You know, it's funny. I've not got to the point where I've met. I mean, there are not many people I haven't met. But, you know, I tell you that. I will tell you if I had a if I had a magic wand. But a magic stick is a better way of putting it. If I had a magic stick, it makes me feel like Gandalf. Uh, <laughs> so if I had a magic stick, and uh, th there is a, there's, a, there's someone I want, have long wanted to write about, and I have not been able to get to, and it's Vladimir Putin. Um, and uh, so there's no, there are not, no celebrities, or, and I've spent a lot of time with the president. Mm. So there's no one, uh, the, the people, he, he, and he is proven inaccessible to me. I think he's a very dangerous character. I worry that he could really do bad things in the world, and I would love a chance to lighten him up a little bit. <laughs> you know, just, just see, I would love to be able to spend some time with him. Uh, and I'd love to be able to write about him. Uh, that he represents something that's kind of, uh, that's alien to me, that feels like it might drag us back into a, a darker and earlier era of, uh, of uh, international affairs. And I, 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 I want to understand that. I was going to ask you who is the person you really never want to meet, but I guess you've already there, answered. No, 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 no. I want to meet. No, but Putin, I would love to meet because I, you know, uh, he, 
so who, uh, well, who I, would I never want to meet? Uh, the Grim Reaper. Uh, that's who I don't want to meet. I don't have, so I don't have anybody like that. Uh, the, the, I suppose the answer would be a high frequency trader uh, in the court of law. Uh, that, that I was, when I wrote Flash Boys, I, was, they, they, I knew I was taking on a group of people who were very litigious and had huge sums of money at stake. And, uh, we're ready for anything. Ready for anything. And that, so I was a little, that, I, would not, I, was a, I was a little worried about that. Well, it's been our fantastic pleasure to actually meet you, Michael, today. So thank you very much. I'm afraid this is over. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'll give you a